the Lord, everybody. I am so happy to be back with you. I am grateful as well to be back with you. I would like to thank Minister Carter for filling in for Pastor. He did such a marvelous job bringing us a wonderful message from the throne of God concerning compassion. Minister Carter, thank you for allowing God to use you to speak to our heart about his compassion towards us. We appreciate you so much for allowing God to use you. I am excited after that great message on last week, so I am ready to get into my message for today. So let's pray and get into God's word together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your grace upon our lives, and we pray as we open your word that you would speak to us and help us not only to hear, but become doers of your word. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's November 1, and can you believe it? 2020 is almost gone. Somebody is saying, listen, pastor, leave it alone. Let 2020 just get on away. Let it just get on out of here. I hear you. 2020 has been rough. We have had to contend with the COVID-19 pandemic worldwide. And then here in the United States, we've had to deal with record number of hurricanes. We've had to deal with social unrest, the display of racism like we haven't seen in years. A record number of forest fires. Uh, we, we're accustomed to forest fires every summer in California, but this year we've had forest fires in multiple states burning thousands and thousands of acres. And so it's been a rough year. And then we have to talk about the election. It's, it's been a rough ride. Not it has been as it, it's over because it's not over yet. We have two more days and the election would technically come to an end, but then we have to count everything. So we don't know how long, uh, how much longer we're going to have to be and live in anticipation as to who our next president will be. But it has been tough. It has been very stressful, this process, getting ready to elect our new president. And then on top of that, we're having to contend with the fact that foreign governments are interfering with our election process. Who would have thought that in America, foreign countries could come in and interfere with our election process. And then, here's one more, peace deals in the Middle East. Who would have thought in the midst of all of this chaos, we could be getting peace deals in the Middle East? Why is that important? Because in the Bible, it tells us that when there is peace in the Middle East, then that is a signal, that is a sign uh, that Jesus is about to return. But hold on. With all this happening at the same time, in the same year, back to back, it leaves many of us, yes, wondering, is this the end time? Is it time for Jesus to return? I want to speak to you from my new sermon series entitled, 
Is it time yet? The reason I want to speak to you about is it time yet? Because uh, in the era that we live in, we have the internet, and every time something big happens around the world, people get on the internet and say, this is it, this is it. <laughs> you, you, you remember Y2K, the year 2000 uh, problem, where they said in 1999, uh, when January 1, 2000 uh, uh, clicks in, that all the computers around the world was going to shut down and it was going to cause all of this chaos. Uh, the internet and went crazy. Everybody started talking about all of these prophets start showing up saying, it's the end of the world. You better get ready. You better stack up your money. You better stack up the food. Some of that same stuff is being said on the internet about the crisis that we're in with the pandemic and all the other things that's going on. I wanted to share a message that didn't scare you, but brought you courage and hope in the midst of chaos, in a time that you don't know what's going to happen. In Acts chapter one, it tells us during the 40 days after Jesus' crucifixion, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he talked with them about the kingdom of God. Acts 1, 6 says that the apostles during this time kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? Jesus said to them, the Father alone has the authority. I want you to get this. The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. And they are not for you to know. So let me tell you, if anybody's out there on the Internet saying in 90 days, six months, two years, if they're out there setting dates, they're a false prophet and they're wrong. Don't get caught up in it. I just want to help bring some clarity and some peace. We have enough going on to have to worry about some other stuff that we have no control over. In Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, the scripture says, after saying this, after saying all of this that no one knows but the Father, the scripture says he, Jesus, was taken up into a cloud while they were watching. His disciples were watching, and they could no longer see him as they strained to see him rising into heaven Two white robed men suddenly stood among them. That was angels. And they said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here stirring into heaven? Jesus as has been taken from you into heaven. But someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. I can remember when I was a little boy, one time, my mom, she made a big mistake with me. I was a little kid. I, I hadn't learned to read and write. I, I, I barely knew some numbers. And one day she told me, son, I'm going to take you to the store at 2 o'clock. Okay. You're going to take me to the store at 2 o'clock. That was all she told me. So I, I walked out of the room and went, went, got dressed, got my little money, came back, and, uh, and I came to her and I said, Ma, is it time yet? Is it 2 o'clock? She says, no, it's not. And every few minutes, I kept interrupting her, asking her, is it time yet? And to find it, she took me into the kitchen and showed me this big thing hanging on the wall. <laughs> yeah, it was a clock. I didn't know what the clock was. Some of you are saying, Pastor, you were a little dumb when you were a kid. Well, I was a kid. I couldn't have been over four or five. Uh, hadn't been to school back then. You didn't go to school till you were six. So uh, wasn't nobody sitting around teaching me all of that. I knew a little bit, but I didn't know anything about a clock. And so she says, listen. And she began to explain the mechanics of the clock. She told me about the big hand. She told me about the little hand. And then she reminded me 
about numbers. I knew how to count pretty good. I could count past 12. And she says, look, this right here, this is 12. And this one here is your two. I says, okay. She says, when the big hand gets on the 12 and the little hand gets on the two, it's two o'clock and I'm going to take you to the store. So I just stood in the kitchen and stared at the clock going back and forth and finally just parking there, waiting for two o'clock. And then at exactly two o'clock, I ran to my mom and says, hey, it is two o'clock, let's go. <laughs> well, it's not that easy for us because God says that it's not for us to know that simple that Jesus is gonna come at this certain time. But even in not knowing, not knowing what time it is, there are still some things that we need to do concerning his return. In Revelation 22 and 20, Jesus proclaims in Revelation, yes, I am coming soon. And that's what I want to tell you today. He is coming soon. But I don't want this to be a time to put fear in you. No, no, no. Uh, we want to look at the coming of Jesus Christ as a time of encouragement. He says, yes, I am coming soon. And then, and then the apostle John responds and says, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This ought to be all of our prayers. Come, Lord Jesus. Let me ask you a question. In all your praying, have you ever asked Jesus to return? <laughs> me either. I thought about it. I pray a lot. I've been praying for years, but I could never remember asking Jesus to return return. I was stunned at that. So I gets up from my study and I go into the bedroom and I ask my wife, Yolanda, I said, sweetheart, have you ever asked Jesus to return when you pray? She gives me this look like, uh -uh. <laughs> most of us have never prayed that prayer. And the reason is, is because we are spending so much time trying to live down here. And there's nothing wrong with trying to live down here and asking God to help us, but we should not just focus our time on living down here. Uh, we should be looking upward, and yes, we should be praying for Jesus' return. Jesus is coming soon. You can understand this even if details of the rapture, even if you don't know what the word rapture as far as the Bible means, if you don't know what the tribulation, the second coming of Jesus, the millennium, and the eternal state remains unclear. We all understand that Jesus is going to come back one day. The imminent return of Jesus and all that is in store for the followers of Jesus should inspire worship and joy. I want to share three things right off the bat, share three things that happens when we pray, come, Lord Jesus. Here's the first thing that happens when we pray, come, Lord Jesus. It will give us comfort. Expecting Jesus to return should bring comfort into our life, not fear. Because when Jesus comes, he's going to make everything all right with us. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 15, the Apostle Paul says, We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves, will rise from their grave. 
then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up. That's what is referred to as the rapture. Will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage, Paul said, encourage other with these words. We should be encouraging people, especially in stressful, chaotic time. Don't get so caught up on the stress that you forget. This is what we should be telling one another. Don't forget Jesus is going to come get us one day. And he's going to make everything. He's going to wipe away all our tears. He's going to help us see. See, some people want to look at heaven as this pie in the sky kind of thing. And, and that, that Christians go and hide the head. But let me tell you something. All of this stuff, one day is going to come to an end. And I am grateful that our Heavenly Father has prepared a place for us to go to have a final rest that is full of peace, joy, in the Holy Ghost. We're going to go to be with Jesus. Jesus is coming back for us. He is going to rescue us from the pain and suffering that's here on earth. No matter how good it can get here on earth, I promise you, it's not as good as heaven. No matter how much stuff we can accumulate and enjoy, the stuff of heaven is better. So take comfort in knowing we are going to be with the Lord forever. Here's the second thing. When we pray, come Lord Jesus, it will prepare us. There are over 300 references in the New Testament concerning the return of Christ and the end times. 216 of the 260 chapters in the New Testament speaks of the return of Christ or the end times. And then 23 of the 27 chapters in the New Testament speaks of the return of Christ or the end time. Why does God put so much emphasis on the return of Christ? And the end time, because God does not want us to be ignorant and fearful of his return. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you, Paul says. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly. You can underline that. It's going to come unexpectedly. We're not going to know when it comes. He says, like a thief in the night, when people are saying everything is peaceful, peaceful and secure, don't be fooled by people saying everything is all right. Everything is going to be all right right now. Uh, he says, everything is peaceful and secure. He says, watch out for people saying that. He says, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begins. And there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things. Dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised. When the day of the Lord comes like a thief, God wants us to be prepared for his return. He does not want us to be taken by surprise. This is why he says so much about his return in the New Testament. So it won't be a fearful time. It won't even really be a negative time. It will be a peaceful and loving time time because Jesus is coming to get us. Here, here's the third one. When we pray, come Lord Jesus, it will refocus us. When we begin to pray, come Lord Jesus, not only will it prepare us, not only will it comfort us, but it will refocus us. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6 says, For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on your guard. He says, be on your guard. 
not asleep like others. Stay alert and be clear headed. God wants us to remain clear headed. And if we haven't been clear headed, he wants us to become clear headed. Even in the midst of chaos, even in the midst of things that are happening that we don't understand, God wants us to have a clear head so that we can stay focused on him. In Matthew chapter 24, uh, beginning at verse 37, it says, when the son of man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's days. Make a note of that. He's telling us, he, he's drawing a picture for us like it was in Noah's days. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered into the boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them away. Turn to somebody. I don't want to tell them like this. I don't want to be caught off guard. Listen to what it says. That is the way it will be when the son of man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken. The other left. Two women will be grinding flour in at the mill. One will be taken. The other left. So you too, he says must keep watch for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time. Somebody say all the time. All the time. For the Son of Man will come when least expected. Jesus is telling us he doesn't want to catch his people unexpectedly, catch us off guard. So he's telling us up front how he's going to come. He's not telling us when. He's just telling us the signs and what's going to be going on and so that we will not be caught off guard. So if God and Jesus is revealing all of this information to us, it's, it, as he is sharing with us that we shouldn't be fearful, that we should be actually praying for Jesus' return, which is a good thing, then the question is, how should we live in the meantime? How should we be living, waiting, for the big hand to get on 12 and the little hand to get on two. Uh, uh, what should we be doing in the meantime? I, I want to share three things with you as I close about how we should be living in the meantime, waiting on our Lord and Savior to come take us. Number one, we should think clearly. God just wants us to have a clear mind. First Peter 4 7 says, the end of all things is near. Therefore be clear minded and self controlled so that you can pray. We spent three weeks, 21 days praying and praying and praying and me preaching about prayer. And right here Peter says keep a clear mind be self-controlled. Don't let yourself get out of control with the pandemic and, and all the chaos. Don't let it shake you so much that you don't have a clear mind. He says, but, 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 but have a clear mind and self-control so that you can pray. Did you know that one of the things that keeps us from praying is the stress in our life, the problems in our life? Things that we don't understand causes us to become so overwhelmed that we don't even think to pray. We don't even feel like praying. But Peter says, because all of this stuff is coming to an end, the end time is coming. And so there's all of this extra stress going around. He says, 
Have a clear mind. How do you keep a clear mind, Pastor? If you keep your mind, stay on Jesus. You should have peace. You should have peace. Scripture tells us if we keep our mind on God, we should have peace. Why should that bring peace to us? Because when you think about God, you are reminded that your problems is this big, but God is this big. See, when you, when you think about God, it can keep your mind clear. It can give you peace because when you think about your money problems being this big, uh, uh, you really understand God is this big. Every problem that you have, no matter how big it is, when you keep a clear mind so that you can pray, you understand that God is bigger than all your problems. If you take all the stuff that's going on in America, all those things that I started with, with the pandemic and all the way down to the forest fires, if you take all of that and put it together and say, wow, this is a big deal, I want you to know our God is bigger and because our God is bigger and because we keep a clear mind and we pray we should have this peace that pass all understanding so how should we be living uh, thinking and praying for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to come back we should be thinking clearly keep a clear mind don't let our mind become fogged up with junk out of the world and then secondly we should focus on relationships we should be living with a clear mind and not only living with a clear mind we should be focusing on relationships did you know that relationships in tough times becomes more important because when you have relationship you have people around you that can be an encouragement First Peter 4, 8 says this, most important of all, I want you to really get this. Peter says, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Continue to show deep love. What's deep love, Pastor. I believe deep love is being able to allow your love, the love of God that resides on the inside of you, to cover the sin, the hurt, the pain that others have caused in your life. It covers that up and allows you to love them in spite of what they've done to you. Last month was Clergy Appreciation Month. I want to thank all of you for the encouraging cards and texts that I received. But I need your help this month. All of November, you know, we generally call it the Thanksgiving month because we celebrate Thanksgiving. I need your help. This is how I need your help. I need your help to show love to our worship department, which includes our singers, our audio team, and our band. Back in August, Yolanda and I celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary and our eighth anniversary as pastor here at our church. And one of the things that we received was some cash. Thank you. We received some cash, but I saved uh, some of that money. And with the money I have saved, this is what I've started using it for. I started using it to bless, to be a blessing to the individuals in our worship department. Yeah, the money that you gave me, I've been taking it and blessing individuals on our worship team. Because what I realized, and I shared this with a few of them 
just the other day. I said, you know what y'all remind me of? Y'all remind me of the postman. You know that saying about the postman? Rain, shine, sleet, or snow. You know, they're going to be out there delivering your mail. And this is what I told them. Rain, shine, sleet, slow. No matter how many of you show up, somebody shows up to get God's work done. And I told them, I appreciate that. And I broke them off a little something, something. And just encouraged them and told them how much I appreciated them. Will you join me this month in showing some deep love to them? Why don't you send them an encouraging text? You know, because this is all about relationship. Email them. Send them a card. Uh, you can also bless them with a gift card. Be creative. Allow God to use you to bless the men and women who allow us to worship God through music. You can say something like this on your card or your text. You can say it to an individual or you can address it to the whole team, however you want to do it. You can say something like this. When I see you on stage singing to the Lord, focus only on him, I am blessed and encouraged to worship God with all my heart. Thank you for leading our congregation in worship. Can you imagine how that's going to make them feel when they get that from us? Next Sunday, we will have our in-person and online service. If you're comfortable, come and join us. Be in service with us. And then you can bring your cards and, and gift cards, whatever you're going to bring. Uh, you can bring it, and we'll have a special basket designated just for them. And you can put it in the box, and we'll distribute it to each one of them. Matter of fact, we can get started today. You can text them right now if you have their cell number. If you're viewing our service on Sunday morning online from our website and you see the chat, you can get involved in the chat and, and, and you can give them a shout out and tell them thank you right there uh, uh, on the chat before everybody and God so the whole world can see how you appreciate what they're doing for God. And then, if you watch them on Facebook or YouTube, uh, you can leave some comments there. Let them know how much you appreciate them. I'm going to actually text someone right now. Uh, as I take time to text someone, why don't you, yeah, we're going to do it right here in the message. Why don't you just take a moment to text someone on the praise team, the band, the audio team, and just tell them how much you appreciate them. Take a moment. I already had mine pre-done, so I don't have to do much here. Done. I just sent it. Someone's about to be blessed. And while we are blessing people, we have to understand that when we become a blessing, it builds relationship. Why? Because relationships are important. Minister O'Hara shared this with me uh, a few days ago. He reminded me of what God says in Genesis 2.18. It is not good for man to be alone. You know, many times during the work of God, ministry, especially as these singers, as they work, sometimes it can get awful lonely and you can begin to feel unappreciated. But when we go ahead and let them know how much we appreciate them, it gives them strength and hope to continue the work that God has for them. That's why relationships 
are important. It helps us to help others. First Peter 4, 9 says this, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. This is something we all should do, not only for our worship team, not only for the pastor. Let me just share from my heart. Let me share this with you. King David, when he was building the temple, and, and they were collecting all of these huge amounts of money, David went into his own pocket his stash and just gave and gave and gave and this is one of the things that David said why should I give when it cost me nothing he was the king he could have took money from the palace and said I'm giving but he took something personal and gave it to the work of God and that's the reason that I take from the money that I make here at the church and even the gifts that you give me and I give it back I give it back I don't just write a check from the church and say here the Lord bless you no I give it from my heart. And that's what I want you to do. Bless these men and women in our worship department and tell them thank you. Pastor, why are you doing this? This pandemic has been hard with churches all over America. We are a small church, but we have been able to bring you a good quality service most Sundays. And it all is with the help of this worship department. Being able to come to you and let you hear some of the songs that you love to hear. That's why we're doing it. This is a time that we should be concerned about our relationships and we bless people. Here's the last thing. We should make a difference. That what I just talked about is going to make a difference, but, but I want to talk about making a difference in a different way. First Peter 4, 10 and 11. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself was speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. He says, we should make a difference. Take the gifts that God has given us and use them. It doesn't always have to be money. The gift of speaking, the gift of hospitality. Use it to make a difference. Here's something else I did just a few days ago. I was at the place where you get your inspection sticker. They change oil and all of that there as well. So my car was in the service area and I was sitting out front on a bench. This young man drove up in his car. The service attendant came out, says, can I help you? And the young man says, I'm back to get my transmission flushed. Last week when I came, I didn't have enough money. But, but, but I'm back today. I got enough money, I think. And the guy says, well, okay. And the guy says, well, how much is it? And the guy says, well, we have a special today. It's normally $89. We're doing it for $69 this week. 
The guy says, okay, and then he leaned over and quietly said, I could still hear him though. He quietly said, say, man, can you help a brother out? And the guy says, well, 69 is the lowest I can go. <laughs> the guy says, well, okay. He gets out of the car and then he looks at the guy and says, now, y'all do take stimulus checks, right? <laughs> and got a big laugh. And then he came down and sat next to me. And right then, God starts speaking to me. And he says, pay for that. So when it was time for me to pay my bill, I went inside, paid my bills. And I told the attendant, by the way, that guy sitting out there that's getting the transmission flush, I want to pay for his. He says, what? I said, yeah, I want to pay for his. And I paid for it. I said, now give me the receipt. And I took the receipt. And before I got out of the door, it was a lady sitting inside. And she says, let the Lord use you, brother. I said, amen. And I went out front and gave him the receipt and said, your service is paid for. This guy got blessed. It brought joy. It looked like a weight lifted off of him. This is what I'm talking about. We should be living during this time, being able to make a difference in this world. We should be making a difference one person at a time so that we can affect the whole world. Because every time that we bless someone in the name of God, they know it was God. He asked me, why are you doing this? I said, because I heard your heart and God wanted me to bless you. That's what we should be doing. Making a difference in this world. Trusting God. Depending on him. Not worrying about when he's going to come. Just making sure that we're ready to be with him when he comes. Here's here, here's the last question. The first question I asked you today was, is it time yet? Here, here's the last question, the last thing I want to say. I don't know if Jesus is going to come back in the very near future, but I, knew, I do know what it is time for. It's time for us to live for heaven. It's time for us to stand for truth. It's time for preachers all over the world to preach the gospel. Stay focused. Preach the gospel. And lastly, it's time to prepare to meet Jesus. Let me ask you an old question. If today was the day for Jesus to return, would you be taken or left behind if you don't know if you can't answer that question if you have to think about it then I want to pray with you because if you don't know where you're going to spend eternity you have the opportunity right now to fix that you can be sure to go back with Jesus when he comes it's simple you just pray this prayer. You acknowledge that you are a sinner. You have not been living for God. And you ask God to forgive you of all your sins, all of your mistakes, all of your problems. And then you ask Jesus to come into your heart and be the Lord of your life. It's just that simple. You simply say, Father, forgive me for all the wrong I have done. Go ahead, say that. And then once you say that, just simply say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life, meaning Jesus, be in charge of my life. I'm going to quit trying to run my life and allow you to run my life from here on out. Thank you, Father, for forgiving me of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart. 
in Jesus name. Now then there may be someone that have accepted Christ but you've been living apart from him. All you have to do is the same thing. Now, Father forgive me. Jesus I acknowledge I haven't been following you. Start leading me again. In Jesus name. It's just that simple. Now all over the place I hope you have gotten your communion elements together because now we're ready. We're clean. We're ready to receive communion. Now, let us all pray. Father, we thank you that you are a forgiving, compassionate Father. You have not forgotten us. You do not want us to be ignorant of Jesus' return. This is why you have put so much in your word concerning his return. Father, we want to look towards heaven and pray for his return with peace, joy, and worship in our heart, God. We thank you, God, that we are clean to receive communion with Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, 24. This is the Apostle Paul. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this and remember some of me. Jesus wants us to remember him until he comes. He wants us to remember all that he did on the cross. So take your bread and eat. Father, we thank you for the body of Christ that was broken for our sin. And then in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 25, Paul says, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of me. Father, we thank you. We remember Christ. We thank you for his blood that washes us clean. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Verse 26, the Apostle Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion, the Lord's Supper, should always be a remembrance that the Lord is due to return. Now let's just worship and thank God for all of his forgiveness and all of his love and all of his compassion. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's continue to worship God, but let's worship God with something tangible. Let's worship him with our tithes and offering. I am so grateful to all of you who continue to hear God and continue to be generous to our church. Without your generous giving, we wouldn't be able to come to you each week with the gospel and to make sure that you have an opportunity to be strengthened and encouraged from your own church online. Thank you so much. Let's pray. Father, we thank you 
for all the generous hearts, God. And we thank you for those who truly want to give but don't have, Father. We pray that you repair their financial issues so that they can give from a sincere heart. Give to you, God, for your glory. And we thank you for everything that you're doing for us as we give. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. I appreciate you so much. And yes, we have a song for you to close with today. And again, remember to bless our praise and worship team. Whether it's the singers, the band, the audio booth, bless them all. Praise the Lord. See you next week. God bless you. Sing it one more time.